Auz billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Insha'Allah today we are starting with Surah Al-Mulk and we'll do the first 5 ayat of Surah Al-Mulk insha'Allah. But before I start I want to address two things here. Number 1, why Surah Al-Mulk? And number 2, how to understand the surah? So firstly, my reason for uh, choosing Surah Al-Mulk at this point is that this surah has been mentioned a lot by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he used to read it every night before going to sleep. The Sahaba were also very fond of it and they called it the preserving one uh, al waqiyah or the saving one al munjia And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that this surah intercedes on behalf of a believer and gets him out of fire. And this is the only surah which has been mentioned to save someone from the turmoils in the grave. And in fact, it is said to be a light which will comfort and guide the soul. So I have always been intrigued by these ahadith and I want to know, and inshallah we'll go on this journey together and we'll find out together why and how is this surah going to be a light in the grave and the hereafter and how is it going to intercede and how is it going to save a human being from hellfire the second thing is we are going to study the surah in a very different way up till now people have always studied it from a believer's point of view i want to share with you this surah from a non-believer's point of view so all of us we are going to think how would a non-believer read this surah how would someone who does not believe in Islam and Allah or a Muslim who has doubts about Islam and Allah, if he reads, he or she they reads the surah, what would their understanding be of this surah? How they are going to respond to the information in this surah? What objections would they have to the information in this surah? And how can this surah in this day and age, in the current era that we are living, make a believer out of a non-believer in the first five ayat. So here is the challenge. We'll start with the first five ayat, inshallah. We'll go through them quickly. As a non-believer or someone who has doubts about Quran, they're not going to go into in depth of the ayat. They're just going to go through it quickly. So we'll go quickly along with them. And by the time we reach ayah number five, inshallah, we will expect to find the light of Iman and unconditional belief in Allah, inshallah. Then we will come back to ayah number one and start to study it in depth from the point of view of a believer. So starting the study of Surah Al-Mulk, 67th Surah of the Quran, from the non-believers or a skeptic Muslim's point of view. And before we start, let me add, I have had personal experience of observing people who are non-believers and those who are skeptical about Islam reading the Quran, and this is how they see and read it. Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of God, the most gracious, the dispenser of grace. Usually this statement is ignored by people who do not believe in the Quran. So we'll move on. Tabarakallazi bi yadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Hallowed is he in whose hand all kingdom of universe rests, since he has the power to will anything. The first thing coming across is there's no mention of Allah. There's no mention of God. There's a mention of someone, hallowed be he, in whose hand is all the kingdom of the universe and he has power to will anything. So no name is being mentioned, which is a bit strange. Ayah number two. He who has created death as well as life so that he might put you to a test and thus show which of you is better in conduct, and he alone is almighty, truly forgiving. Interesting concept. Death is mentioned first, then life. Can't make sense why that is the case. But then there is something very interesting here. It says that he's created people so he can find out or test them. Well, that makes sense, testing them. Which one has a better conduct? Okay, good. Not the best conduct, but the better conduct. And he's almighty, truly forgiving. So in this verse, uh, a certain purpose of life is being explained. One may or may not agree with it, but a purpose of life has been given why God created life. 
آیا نمبر تھری اللہ خلا کا صبا سما واتن تبا کم ما ترافی خلق رحمان من تفاوت فرجیل بسر حل ترا من فطور ہی ہو ہیز کریٹڈ سیون ہیونز ان فل ہارمنی ود ون انادر نو فالٹ ول یو سی ان دا کریشن آف دا موسٹ گریشیس اینڈ ٹرن یور ویژن اپون اٹ ونس مور یو کانٹ سی اینی فلاز Okay, so he's created seven heavens. This concept is in Christianity, Judaism, many other religions, even Buddhism has it, Zoroastrianism has it too, seven heavens, in full harmony with one another. Yeah, other religions don't mention, so okay, fine. Quran is mentioning there in full harmony. No fault would you see in the creation, fine. Uh, we expect the creator to do a perfect job. And then it says, turn your vision once more. Can you see any flaws? Well, no, so far, astronomy, astrology has not detected any flaws. Everything seems to be fine. But most religions claim that. Everyone claims that God is perfect and he does a perfect job. Ayah number four. By the way, we've already done more than, more than half of the five ayahs. Up till now, a non-believer or a skeptical believer who are reading these ayahs, they're not having any big impact. Summarjil basara karrataini yan qalib ilayka al-basaru khasiyan wa huwa khasir. So turn your vision upon it again and yet again. And every time your vision will fall back upon you dazzled and truly defeated. Allah has thrown a challenge here. You just said that it's all perfect. He said it's all perfect. Yes, there are no flaws. Yes. And then he says, no, look again. He's challenging. Look again. What does he want me to look at again? Where is the challenge? I've looked once. There are no flaws. Everything seems to be fine. Why do I have to look again? Okay, there better be something really big after this ayah because he's asking me to look again and again and again. Well, give me something to look at which is different from what I'm seeing already. So let's go to ayah 5 to see why Allah is asking that we should focus and look again and again and what's so special there. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَسَابِيهَا وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رَجُومًا لِلشَّيَاتِينَ وَعَطَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابَ السَّيْرِ And indeed we have decorated the skies nearest to the earth with مَسَابِيهَ which is translated as lights and have made them missiles for devils, شَيَاتِين and for them we have readied suffering through a blazing flame End of five ayat. Our non-believer and the skeptical Muslim are no nearer to faith. In fact, they have been provided more fuel for their skepticism and disbelief. The last ayah has got a lot of stuff which is objectionable to modern science. After five ayat, the non-believer or the skeptical has now turned into a critic of the Quran. And believe me, this is exactly what Allah wanted. He wants people to think about this ayah and to criticize it, especially in this day and age. 1400 years ago, it was no problem. You've got masabi lamps in the sky and they are being used as missiles, as rajam, like stones being thrown for shayateen. Fine, people had no problem with that. Uh, Christians believed in God having a son. Jews believed... In God having many sons, if you read Genesis, the first chapter, it says that uh, angels came down and sons of gods came down and they had children with human beings. Other religions, for example, Hindus believed in elephant gods and snake gods and uh, head of an elephant and body of a human being. So that was okay. Having masabi in the sky or having missiles uh, thrown at devils was no big deal at that time. But in this day and age... This ayah is throwing a challenge to modern science and is asking us and asking the scientists, believers or non-believers, come and critique me, come and object to it. So let's start with objections. Objection number one. وَلَكَذْ زَيَّنَ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَسَابِيهَا Why has Allah chosen the word masabiha? Throughout the Quran, Allah Ta'ala describes stars as najm, kawkab, kawakib, najum. What is masabiha? Masabi or misbah is something which creates the same kind of light as is found in the day. Where does the daylight come from? From the sun. So the misbah or masabi 
they should be creating the same kind of light as the sun. That's why when you have a lamp in your room, you call it a misbah or masabi. Or you turn a light on, you call it a misbah or masabi. Why? Because inside the room with the lamp, whether it's an oil lamp or an electric light, you can read, you can look around just like in daylight. But the stars don't do that. And for centuries, people have thought of it and objected to it and said, these stars are tiny and they are not producing the light, which is like the sunlight. And you can't even read in starlight. Moonlight, maybe you could have a bit of a day-like effect. Why did Allah describe the stars in the sky as something which simulates daylight or simulates the sunlight? Why didn't he say Kawakib and Najum and leave it at that? Stars, big stars, small stars, and leave it at that. Why say this? And the answer, every one of these stars you see are stars like the sun. And every one of them has their own area of lighting up like the sun. They have their own solar system. And around these stars, there is daylight. If you are standing there or going in a spaceship or if there's a planet nearby, it will have daylight. So what Allah is telling you is, look at those stars which have put in the heaven. Every one of them is like the sun which comes in the day. Every one of them is capable of creating daylight in its vicinity. This was not known to anyone 1400 years ago, even was not known a few hundred years ago. People always thought stars were small, brighty things. Nobody ever thought they were as big as the sun or capable of producing the same amount of daylight in their vicinity as the sun. But Allah called them Masabi 1400 years ago. But wait a minute. The second part of the ayah, how do you justify that? And they've been made missiles for the devils. If you're talking about the same stars, which can be like the sun, these are massive structures. You're not talking about asteroids and comets. We are talking about the stars, which Allah says are like the sun. When do you see them being fired as missiles against anything? And why are they fired as missiles? And the explanation comes from Ahadith. The Prophet ﷺ, when he went on Miraj, which was his ascent into heaven and he went across the seven heavens and he saw Allah, met up with Allah, he described the journey in detail. So he says between the first heaven, the one we see where Allah says that he's put uh, Misabir, these uh, sun-like stars, he says they were big gateways, massive gate connecting the first heaven to the second heaven. Out of those gates, he saw streams of angels coming out from the second heaven to the first heaven and whenever the devils the shayateen they tried to enter from the first heaven to the second heaven to get some information from the angels there were stars which were thrown at them like a missile and they drove them away and this has been mentioned elsewhere too in quran and hadith and we know especially since the quran came to the lowest heaven allah ta'ala had increase the security at these gateways. And if anyone would try to cross from the first heaven to second heaven, they would have whole stars flung at them. Whole stars, like the size of sun or bigger than the sun, flung at them. So that was acceptable, reasonable, understandable 1400 years ago, even 200 years ago, 150 years ago. But with the modern science, we have to come up with good explanation. We have to come up with good explanation for three things now. After the hadith, we have even increased the challenge. Now we have to prove, number one, that there are gateways in the first heaven, the one that you and me see. There should be gateways there. The Prophet ﷺ, he said he saw them. We've got the Hubble telescopes. We've got lots of technology. So there better be gateways connecting the first heaven to the second heaven. Number two, out of these gateways... Well, angels should be coming out. Well, if, if not angels coming out, something should be coming out from the second heaven to the first heaven. And number three, these gateways should be protected by stars which are being thrown out as missiles for anyone who wants to cross them. So it should be difficult to enter these gateways because there are stars which are being thrown out, flung out like missiles. Okay, that's what the Quran says. Rajum al Rajam is throwing something like a stone. So three major objections. Let's start with objection number one. 
where are these big gateways or show me at least one gateway which connects the first heaven to the second heaven and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw it and traveled through it. And here is the proof. And the proof is not from the Quran. The proof is not from the Hadith. The proof is not from the believers. The proof is from the non-believers. New Scientist, 27th of April 2007. David Shiga, writer for the New Scientist, says that there is a heated discussion going on in April 2007 that black holes could be the portals to other universe. So in every universe and galaxy, there are these areas which are very dark and where matter is very concentrated and they were always thought to be dead pits that whatever goes in them does not come out and they've got huge gravity and these are collapsed stars known as black holes and they suck everything in and never let anything out. But in 2007, David Shiga says that theories are being formulated that these black holes are actually connecting this universe to the next universe. So what they are doing is they are passages, gateways from this heaven to the second or next heaven. Fast forward, April 12, 2010, National Geographic magazine, quite a reliable and uh, authenticated publication. And what does National Geographic say in April 12, 2010? A black hole is actually a tunnel between universes. Previously, they thought there would be something called a wormhole, which is going to do this, uh, connect one universe to another. But they say, no, black holes are the wormholes. The matter in the black hole doesn't collapse into a single point, as has been predicted before, but rather goes out a white hole at the other end of the black one. And they're quoting people uh, like uh, Indiana University physicist Nikodim Poploski, who wrote a recent paper in the journal Physics Letter B. And he even presented a new mathematical model. And they suggest that it's even possible to have time travel through these black holes. So question number one answered. The Prophet ﷺ saw gateway connecting heaven one to heaven two. And we know that there are black holes in our very own galaxy connecting this universe to the next universe. The second challenge, the Prophet ﷺ, he saw streams of angels coming out of the gateway. Now we know that black holes, by theory, suck everything in and nothing comes out of them. So if these black holes are the same gateway that the Prophet ﷺ described, then something should be coming out of them. Maybe not angels, we can't identify angels, they're invisible. But there should be some evidence of movement from the other universe to this universe, from the second heaven to the first heaven. And I looked for the evidence, and I couldn't find it in the Quran, and I couldn't find it in the Hadith. But I found it in a journal of astronomy, published on July 12, 2018, and the writer is Phil Plate, P-H-I-L-P-L-A-I-T, who reports that monster black holes shoot out neutrinos like cosmic bullets. Now, there are two things here. The theory that black holes don't let anything come out is wrong. It's gone. There are things coming out of black holes. And these are neutrinos, which are ghostly subatomic particles, which don't interact with matter and light. Now, I'm not saying neutrinos are angels, and I'm not saying there is no association between angels and neutrinos. But what I'm saying is, that the description that the Prophet ﷺ gave of the gateway connecting first heaven to the second heaven is proven by modern astrology which have seen particles coming out of the black hole, hence indicating movement from one universe to another. Now moving on to the third challenge, the biggest question. وَجَالْنَاهَا رَجُومًا لِشَيَاتِينَ and Allah says these big massive stars like the sun, some of them bigger than the sun, Allah has made them like missiles which could be shot at, flung at shayateen who are trying to enter from heaven 1 to heaven 2 through the gateways. So to prove this, we should be looking at the gateways which are the black holes and there should be stars shooting out. Whole stars, not comets and asteroids, stars. 
So let's look at the closest black hole we have. The closest black hole we have is known as Sagittarius A, which is at the center of the Milky Way's galaxy. This is the galaxy we live in. And if anyone wants to travel from this heaven to the next heaven, from this universe to the next universe, from planet Earth, whether it is a human or a jinn or shaitan, the closest gateway is Sagittarius A. So telescopes have been pointing at the center of the Milky Way galaxy at Sagittarius A for decades, getting better and better equipment and better and better resolution and computer analysis. And this black hole, the Sagittarius A, is a massive black hole. It has 400 million suns mass. So if you take 400 million suns like the sun we have, put them together, that is the mass of this black hole. And astronomers say that you need massive black holes to connect this universe to the next one. So the Journal of Astronomy, known as Astronomy Now, on 13th of November 2019, this is just last year, it's less than seven months ago, it reports, quote, Milky Way's central black hole, Sagittarius A, flings star out of galaxy, end quote. Furthermore, it says that the star which they have named S5-HVS1 is 2.3 times the mass of our sun. So it's a massive star. And it is 29,000 light years away from us. And it was flung away with a velocity of more than 6 million kilometers per hour, which is 3.7 million miles per hour. But the Milky Way is so big, it's going to take it a hundred million years to pass through the galaxy's outskirts and into the great void of intergalactic space. Now, because light, light reaches us very late, they looked at the trajectory of the star and they have calculated that this event happened about five million years ago. So any stars which had been flung out 1400 years ago, we still don't have the light from them reaching us and we are not able to register them. On our telescopes and we know that 1400 years ago when the Quran came to the first heaven the security increased and the number of stars being flung according to Quran and Hadith has increased and an astronomer by the name of Gary da Costa at Australian National University has said that looking at this star being flung out of the galaxy he's using the word Rajam flung out of the galaxy by the supermassive black hole at its center is proving a theory which was proposed in 1989 by a certain astronomer whose name is Jack Hills, and this is known as Hills Mechanism. In other words, Ayah number 5 of Surah Al-Mulk, to prove it, the theory was presented in 1989, and the proof was seen in 2019. Because before that, we did not have the intellect or the capacity to prove this Ayah. And there are many of those ayahs in the Quran, which we are not able to understand at this time. But in the future, they would be proved. And they would be proved by human observation and human science. Just like the proof Allah has provided for the stars in the sky being masabih, being like the sun. For the giant gateways connecting the first heaven to the second heaven, which we call black holes. For the proof of movement from second heaven to the first heaven, which we have seen as neutrinos being shot out like cosmic bullets from the black holes. And most importantly, for whole stars being flung out from the edges of the black holes as if they are security and they are stopping unwanted movement across the black holes from one universe to another. Just like Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا رَجُومًا and this is why Surah Al-Mulk is so unique. This is why the Surah Al-Mulk will become the light of Iman, the Noor, in this life and the hereafter. This is why it will enlighten the grave and make it easy for a person's soul to go through the grave and be guided in the life and hereafter. Anyone who reads this Surah and understands it will not have a shred of doubt that this is the word of Allah, the creator of the universe, because he is describing his creation so perfectly 1400 years ago, that even today our latest scientific knowledge cannot find any loopholes in that description. 
And how could he do that? How could he perfectly describe everything? The answer is ayah number one. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكُ وَهُوَ أَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Hallowed is he in whose hand is all the dominion, all the kingdom of the universe. Your galaxies and heavens and universes and the black holes and the planets and the stars and the neutrino stars and the pulsars, no matter what they are, they're all within his control. وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ And he has the power to will anything. The power to connect this universe to another universe, the heaven one to heaven two, and so on and so forth to seven heavens. The power to take the Prophet ﷺ from this world up to the seventh heaven through those gateways and show him all those signs and evidences which today our telescopes are managing to find out. And the word tabarak is not a simple word. It comes from baraka. And the word baraka is from al-bar. Al-bar means two things. Number one, stability. Something stable. Like bar is land. We say bar azam bar saghir Continents, they're referred to as bar. So stability is denoted by the word bar. And the second thing which al-bar means is exponentially increasing. If I may give an example, in the start, Allah made the earth and the earth had no plants, nothing. There was water and earth. And then one plant grew. And from that one plant, the whole planet got covered with grass and shrubs and trees and herbs and all kind of plant life. And from that plant life, animals got nutrition and they progressed in numbers on land and they grew all over the planet. So that is the kind of thing that baraka is, exponential increase. So Allah says that He is tabarakallazi. He is the one with baraka. He has stability and the ability to exponentially increase His creation. And the word kadir means someone who is always continuously capable. Kadir is capable. But Qadir is someone who is continuously capable because all the powers of Allah are continuously increasing and in action. It's not a one-off thing. He has got dynamic powers which are ever increasing and ever in action. Even the miracle of his message is continuous even after 1400 years. It never ceases to amaze mankind. And the ayah number two, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْأَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ There is mention of death before life. And this is very important because if Allah would say He created life and death, people might assume it's the start and the end. And He says, no, I created death and life, giving an indication that after every life there is death and then He'll create again and that creation would be forever. And in this ayah, Allah has given the whole purpose of life and creation in a very beautiful way. Allah Ta'ala says, لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala." Life is a test for you. So Allah could see which one of you can do better conduct. Now he did not say the best conduct. If it was the best conduct, he'll say, أَحْسَنُ amala." He says, no, أَحْسَنُ amala." better conduct. And you would not find this concept in any other religion except in Islam. Now, doing something better is in two ways. Number one, it's comparative. For example, you have a fundraising for uh, orphans, for example. And one man comes and he gives 200 pounds. Another man comes and he gives 100 pounds. So who's done the best? Who's number one? Who's got the first position, the biggest fund? It's the one who gave 200 pounds. And who's second? The one who gave 100 pounds. But if the person giving 200 pounds is a millionaire and the person who's giving 100 pounds has only got a thousand pounds saving, this second one is better than the first one. Although he gave less money, he gave a very large proportion of his wealth. And Allah says, I test you and I judge you on how better your acts are. Not on the magnitude of your deeds but the magnitude of your effort this is what makes islam unique to other religions and the second implication of being better is 
that Allah wants us to continue to improve in our deeds. He's saying to you and me, I know you'll never be perfect. I know you'll never do the best. I am expecting from you to do better and better and better every day. Keep improving little bit every day with every passing year of your life. Make your deeds better. And yes, there will be shortcomings. And yes, you will make mistakes. But remember, وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ He is the Almighty and truly forgiving. And this is one of the biggest drawbacks we have nowadays. We always want to do the best. And if we can't do the best, we don't do anything. We said, either I'm going to do the best, I'm going to pray in the best possible way, I'll be the best Muslim ever, or I'm not going to do anything because it's not worth doing. No, this is definitely not what Allah wants from you. And this is definitely not what we can achieve. We can never achieve perfection in anything, including religion. And that is why Allah says, He's the Aziz al Ghafur. He's the Almighty. Al Aziz is the one who's powerful and respected and he is the one who's going to be the truly forgiving and al-ghafoor means someone who's continuously forgiving so ghafir is the one who forgives but who's continuously ghafir is ghafoor and he said you will continuously make mistakes you'll try to be better and better but every time you will have some drawbacks and you would continue to make mistakes so that's okay I am there to continuously forgive. Don't aim for perfection. Don't get obsessed by perfection. Don't become obsessive, compulsive for perfectionism. Keep doing better. And talking of perfection, here comes ayah number three. Allazi khalaka sabah samawatin tibaqam ma tarafi khalqi rahmani min tafawud. Farji al basar hal tara min futur. He is the one who's made the seven heavens conforming to each other. They are seamless, perfectly conforming to each other. You would not see any fault in them. No flaws, no imperfections. Farji al basar and turn your vision upon it once more. Can you see any flaw? Hal tara min futur? Do you see any rift? Do you see any flaw? But this ayah has created some objections and some confusions among scholars, especially those who are critiquing Islam. They say, Allah says, Hal tara min futu? Do you see any rift? Do you see any flaw? But in another part of the Quran, Allah says that Allah is the Father of Samawat. He is the one who creates a rift in the heavens. So how do you reconcile both of these? And once again, this is the perfection of Quran. When Allah is saying he's father of Samawat, he's talking about the creation of the world. When you create a house, you dig, you make foundations and you see a lot of defect. And Allah says, I'm the one who initiated, who cut, who dig and created this universe. But once I've created it, you cannot see any flaw in it now. Just like when a tailor cuts the cloth. You can see pieces of cloth lying and there are gaps between the pieces of cloth. But once he stitched them, it becomes seamless. It becomes flawless. And this is exactly what Allah is saying. That when I created the world, I created with a, with a rift. The whole universe had a rift in it. But now that I've stitched it together as one universe, go and see. You will not find any flaw in my creation. And look again and again and you will not find anything. Then turn your vision to it again and again. And every time your vision will fall back upon you, dazzled and truly defeated. Khasian means frustrated, bewildered, weakened, dull. Allah Ta'ala is saying, find a fault in my creation. He's challenging us. He says, go on, find a fault. And you would not be successful. And then hasir means tired, exhausted, very worn out. So it says, you'll keep on trying and trying and trying. You'll exhaust yourself. You'll exhaust your resources, your telescopes, your spaceships, your satellites. They'll all be exhausted, but you won't find any imperfection. And then Allah throws that challenge of ayah number five. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَسَابِيهَا وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رَجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ 
وَعَتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابَ الصَّعِيرُ And he says, look, I'll give you something to critique. Okay, you can't find anything. Let me give something to critique. Come, criticize this. I'm telling you all these stars are masabi. They make daylight like the sun. Think of it. I'm giving you food for thought and I'm giving you fuel for criticism. Go on, critique this and you'll find I'm right and you're wrong. And then I'm going to tell you that to hold big stars, I'm flinging them like missiles at the gateways of heavens. Go, object to this, look into it, and you'll see them being flung out. And I am right. My perfection is there. And you would be tired. You'd be worn out. You'd be exhausted. You'd be bewildered and frustrated. You would get weary with all your criticism. And he invites you to criticize. He's not saying do not object and criticize. He says... Come and do a critical analysis of my word, my message, my Quran and my creation and you shall not find any flaw. And we went very quickly to the last part of ayah number 5. وَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابُ الصَّعِيرُ For the devils who tried to move from heaven 1 to heaven 2 and Allah has stopped them from doing so, Allah says, we have readied suffering through a blazing flame. That is a general translation. But there's a lot of depth to it. Atadna is actually a derivative of the word adadna or adadna, which means to count. So Allah is saying that their punishment would be counted, precise. It would be accounted for. Whatever they do, I'm not going to punish them excessively. They are going to be punished by an accounted maya. And the word sair in Arabic language is also used for price. So what Allah is saying, my punishment is not something harsh. It's not something unfair. It is the price you pay. A calculated price. Atadna and sair. Calculated price paid for your crimes and misdeeds. And what a beautiful way to end this ayah with the message that every word, every ayah, every sentence of the Quran is meaningful, accurate, and a miracle in itself. And now you know that if we understand Surah Al-Mulk, it will remove any doubt in the heart of a human being which we might have about faith and about our belief in Allah. And that is why... Keeping Surah Al-Mulk as a companion is going to be one of the ultimate saviors for us in this life and the hereafter. Because when in the grave, the malaika, the angels come and they ask you, Ma Rabbuka, Ma Dinoka, who's your God? What's your religion? Anyone who has read and regularly reflected on Surah Al-Mulk would have absolutely no doubt in their heart to say, without a shred of a doubt, my Rabb is Allah and my deen is Islam. And on the day of judgment, this surah is going to be your witness to Allah that yes, he has read and understood me and there was no doubt left in his heart by the evidence provided in Surah Al-Mulk. And it is such an amazing surah as we go along studying it every Friday, inshallah, I'll tell you that from the start till the end, this surah is full of miracles and each and every word of it stands the test of time and scientific knowledge and scientific criticism. And inshallah, I look forward to sharing it with you. And inshallah, together we can spread this word of Allah to all believers and non-believers. Ameen, summa ameen. Please remember everyone in your prayers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.